The healthcare dynamic is rapidly changing. Understanding the basic fundamentals related to the business of medicine empowers practitioners to advance their skills in and knowledge of the business aspects of medicine. SMA's Business of Medicine Simplified Program explores the essentials of everything from reimbursement and compensation models, insurance and risk management, to practice employment and business finance. Telehealth. What, why, and how can it work for you? Telehealth is a collection of means or methods for enhancing health care, public health, and health education delivery and support using telecommunications technologies. Telehealth encompasses a broad variety of technologies and tactics to deliver virtual medical, health, and education services. Join us for Health Technology Insights, Telehealth, What, Why, and How Can It Work for You? Drs. Andy Mohan and Reza Sadesian will discuss the various aspects of telemedicine and how to use this information to the benefit of your patients in practice. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, some of the definition first uh, to kind of bring a better perspective on what we mean by telehealth versus telemedicine. Um, and out of all the definitions that are out there, the one that I really like is that the, they said telehealth is um, really the it, telehealth comp uh, encompasses a broad variety of technology and tactics to deliver virtual medicine, health and educational services. So as we as we can figure out from this, telehealth is not a specific service service, but a collection of means to enhance care and uh, education delivery. Now, when it comes to telehealth or telemedicine, uh, telemedicine is often is still used when referring to traditional clinical diagnosis and monitoring that is delivered by such technology. However, the term telehealth is now more commonly used as it describes, as I said, the wide range of diagnosis and management, education, and other related field of healthcare. Um, the next thing that I would like to talk about is the telehealth modality. Uh, telehealth encompasses four distinct domain of application as we uh, normally refer to live uh, video or synchronous, which means that we have a live two-way interaction between a person, could be a patient, caregiver, provider, and a physician uh, using audiovisual telecommunication technology. This is a real time uh, scenario, and this is the one that may serve as a substitute for an inpatient encounter when it's possible. The second modality is store and forward, which is asynchronous type. And this is a transmission of recorded health history. For instance, if you have an X-ray, if you have an image, you wanna send it to dermatologist, if you have an EKG, this is the type of services that provider use most of the time to consult usually a uh, specialist or subspecialist to kind of get a second opinion. This can also be done through a variety of means uh, such as uh, email or secure text messaging. The third modality is a remote patient monitoring or what we call it RPM. And this is a personal health and medical data collection from individual in one location, most of the time via electronic medical record, and then transmitted to the physician that who are accessing this data remotely from other location. And this type of service allow a provider to continue to track healthcare data for a patient once, for instance, that patient is released to home or they're providing care under the primary care services. And this is the part that we're hoping by using it to reduce readmission rate. An example of those could be blood glucose monitoring services. The last part, the last modality uh, is the mobile health or what we call it M health, or some people refer to as mobile digital health. And these are uh, healthcare and public health practice and education that are supported by this technology. So you can use your iPhone or Android phone or any other tablet that uses such application on it and use those application to promote uh, the, the, the delivery of care uh, through different mechanisms. 
Now, telemedicine also has been growing rapidly and offers uh, fundamental benefits. The four fundamental benefits that I really like the way American Telemedicine Association has focused on was first, access to care. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have been having over the past uh, couple of decades is that how can we bring services to the remote area? When you go to the larger city, we have plenty of physicians. When you go to the smaller community, we don't have that uh, luxury. So how can we use this to, to improve access to care? Now, the second part is the cost efficiency. Um, as we all know, as of uh, the latest report, the uh, GDP or our gross domestic product uh, for healthcare spending is about 17.9% now. So reducing the cost of healthcare is one of the most important reasons for adopting such technology, um, and uh, which is beneficial for patients, insurance, and also the hospital setting for short of length of a stay. The third part is the improved quality. So uh, if we have uh, enough tools to provide uh, uh, healthcare for individuals, that's one way to improve their uh, quality of care. And two examples that I can think of is <clears throat> mental health and EICU. So these are some of the areas that technology have proven numerously that uh, they can improve quality of care for those type of populations. And the last one, not the least one, is a patient demand. So uh, consumer today, in today's world, they, they're more willing to accept technology. And once they realize that, oh, I don't need to travel uh, such a long distance to see my specialist to consult about my follow-up weight management, this is a huge improvement for them. And as uh, uh, you can uh, go through the literature, there have been numerous studies that has they, they have documented patient satisfaction and support for telemedicine services. Now, from the provider perspective, if you want to focus on uh, uh, some of the areas that I alluded in the previous slide, such as uh, remote monitoring and mobile health, there are numerous application and devices that are available. Uh, that uh, physician can leverage uh, even in a smaller outpatient community to support the needs of their patient. Um, some of the issues that are uh, associated with those is uh, whether or not the infrastructure of that facility can handle such technology, how we're going to collect some of this data uh, as some of these apps are uh, provided by a third party that they don't necessarily need to go through the FDA regulations. Uh, where are we going to collect those, uh, store those information? Uh, who is going to oversee those? And, uh, you know, the concern that we always have about HIPAA and the privacy of those uh, information uh, for the patient. Um, with that being said, I want to get Andy's perspective on the provider uh, uh, side of the telehealth and uh, mHealth. What do you think, Andy? Uh, thanks, Reza. Um... You know, there's a, there's a lot of great tools out there uh, for providers uh, and patients to utilize um, that would help in, uh, you know, improving quality of care and uh, managing um, disease real time, chronic conditions, uh, those type of things. Uh, you know, they, you have uh, for diabetic patients, you have, you know, your insulin uh, infusion pump so you can you can manage uh, or uh, real time um, uh, gauge uh, glucose levels. Uh, that your, your your provider would be able to see, even if they had a, a you know hemoglobin A1C, they'd, they'd be able to see per day what uh, the glucose levels are um, uh, real time. So that those kind of things are kind of important. Medication devices. So compliance is always a big issue for uh, uh, you know medication compliance for those uh, those elderly patients that are on chronic medications. Um, whether they take them or, or not is is always an issue, um, and in terms of them being frequent flyers into uh, EDs. So um, monitoring those, uh, there are devices that you can actually uh, ensure that they're taking their medications, and that would be sent via um, the internet or the web to, uh, that data would be sent directly to your PCP. So there are devices like that. Um, always a, a pretty big issue. 
There's also other remote uh, patient monitor monitoring devices. Uh, of course, there's education types of telehealth. I mean, you could, there's so many different education uh, ways of educating patients or providers uh, as well. Uh, one of them being immunizations and, and growth milestone education applications. Uh, just a lot of ways to do things that are out there now that uh, can promote population health, which is a very big term now, population health and, and making sure that the, the, uh, the masses are dealt with before they even get into the hospital, preventing them to, from getting, you know, from being admitted or um, having to see their, uh, their doctors on a regular basis. These type of devices are going to prevent that and essentially reduce healthcare costs, like Reza mentioned uh, before. Um, you know, uh, the data collection, uh, of course, is is uh, it's very very important. Um, and um, you know how a lot of these these applications are going to have methodologies on how they store the data. That is accessible. Uh, providers are going to want to know exactly how they're uh, they're stored. Um, uh, how long they're stored for, and if there is some sort of protective layer uh, based upon how they're stored uh, to protect in terms of HIPAA and pr privacy and you know that data breach by by hackers. Uh, that's always accessible. It just needs to be asked. Um, and of course, the collection of data is going to improve outcomes and the quality of care, um, and uh, and provide providers the ability of um, um, improving or bettering uh, their clinical hypo hypothesis before even seeing a patient. All right. So uh, those are very uh, great points, Andy. Thanks for bringing those up. Uh, as, as far as the patient perspective, uh, I think Andy also alluded to some of those examples I was going to mention here. But um, I think it is very important for clinicians to understand that in today's uh, uh, time, the patients and their families uh, that are engaged with technology, they may aware of a lot more available tools that we even know as a physician exist, as we are very busy with our clinical work, with our documentation and other issues that we deal with. And often uh, when patients come to my practice, sometimes they teach me that, hey, have you seen this application that I can use? And it's amazing, especially the younger generation, how much they're involved with this technology and social media and they learn more. And if you look at um, the Apple and Google store where there are more, over 72,000 medical app, I mean, it's just so many applications available that, yeah, we're worried about uh, the privacy and um, the, um, integrity of the app and the patient uh, HIPAA, but it's also looking on the bright side, how can we leverage uh, some of these very easy tools to provide care for the patient and their family? And also it helps our workflow much easier and better uh, uh, in, in terms of providing care for those patients. Um, do you agree, disagree, Andy, with that? Yeah, I do. Uh, I agree with uh, what you're saying, uh, Reza. I think that, uh, you know, the way I'm looking at uh, from a patient perspective, um, you have the, the, uh, the younger population, the younger group of patients, and then you have the older population. The younger group, obviously, they are going to be very, very tech savvy. Most of them are pretty tech savvy. Um, and I'd like to say that they're pretty conscious about their health, too. Um, you know, I, I, there is and, and Reza, of course, you're going to know about this a lot more than, you know, being that being a pediatrician. But, um, you know, obesity, it's it's it is uh, it is an epidemic. But, you know, I, I tend to think that a lot of uh, the, the, the kids I see are a lot more. They're a lot more health conscious. They're eating the right types of foods in schools. Um, and uh, and they're also tech savvy. So they're they're They will be using a lot more of these mobile apps to educate themselves on on um, on their health. Uh, as well as monitoring um, their uh, their health status, their you know specific vitals, or whether they're they're supposed to be on certain medications, they're going to be doing that a lot more. And we need to concentrate that uh, uh, a lot more on this group because they're going to be living longer. So they're going to live longer. So we need to make sure that they're a lot healthier. They're they're not sedentary. They're less obese, and they are using a lot of the the tech um, that is available to them at their home that can be 
uh, transmitted to providers. Um, the older population, you know, right now there's a statistic in terms of Medicare, we spend about $40 million a day on Medicare uh, expense. That's, that's huge. So the older population in terms of population health is going to be a, kind of a vital area for a lot of physicians, family medicine physicians. Of course, for you, uh, Reza, being a pediatrician, uh, you're more, more focused on the, the kids. But uh, these, uh, this older population, um, they, they are not as tech savvy. They don't use these mobile applications. They shy away or unwilling, uninterested uh, and there, there, there are obviously myths that they uh, that the da data collection is going to be somewhat used as uh, something that is intrusive. So it's intrusive on their their privacy. Uh, that's obviously that for us that we know that that is not the truth. Uh, we need to educate them a lot more uh, on using this. Uh, you know, there are health coaches and those type of things that that go out to these uh, these these uh, patients' homes and and educate them on other things like you know fall risks and um and uh their nutrition those type of things that prevent them from coming into the hospital uh but perhaps a, there's an opportunity there for uh tech education as well um you know it's that would definitely help reduce healthcare costs and and these frequent flyers going into the ED um and help providers manage their chronic disease and make sure they're compliant on their medications um and uh, and it's especially the non-life-threatening ones. We don't want the we don't want the uh, providers to have to to. Uh, uh, it, these are only for acute illnesses and chronic uh, diseases, and to uh, um, potentially uh, refer to specialists um, to stay away from the non-life-threatening uh, um, cases. Um, Reza, what do you think? I think those are very valid and great points, especially given, you know, in my field and uh, you having two uh, children going through some of those uh, doctor's visits and leveraging some of the apps for you. I think that is that's a brilliant approach and not only keeping the doctors on their feet, but also you guys know what exactly going on with the child. I think that those are very well use of technology. Um, the next one is about regulations, and you know uh, this is a big issue uh, on the next slide uh, about reimbursement and malpractice. So, um, you know, a lot of people come and ask, uh, uh, you know, about the payment and coverage for the services that are delivered under some of these larger telehealth, in particular telemedicine uh, uh, for, for, their, uh, for their patients. So a, very, a frequently asked question among clinicians interested in using such technology is, how does my state telemedicine policies compare to others? Which state offer the best policy for physicians using telemedicine? Or which states um, uh, impose barriers to telemedicine access for patients and providers? And uh, I think it's very important uh, to it's very important to know you need to know the reimbursement and medical practice rules in your states where you're practicing and American Telemedicine Association has developed that very easy to use a state by state evaluation that they turn into the report they call it gap analysis coverage and reimbursement which uh, we have the link for you um, at the end of this uh, podcast. So what, what it does, it ex extracts and compares physician practice standard for telemedicine for every state in the US. And then ultimately, by evaluating different protocols in terms of uh, physician patient encounter, telepresenter, the informed consent and licensure, and some other uh, mechanism and metrics, they assign a grade which indicates existing policy barriers that inhibit the use of technology, which is telemedicine, that would enable the patient provider choice to uh, quality health care uh, service in that state. So I highly encourage people to uh, take a look at this document. It's a PDF file. Look up their states. If they have any question regarding the use of technology and seeing patient uh, in terms of reimbursement and um, uh, uh, licensure and uh, practice standards, 
and we would be happy to help you guys out if you need more uh, information on those. But um, as far as I would say is, this is an issue with every estate and clinicians, and it varies from state to state. So it's really important to be up to date with the rules and regulation in your estate. Um, Andy, do you have anything to add to yeah. this? Yeah, I have a couple of things to add. Um, reimbursement I, I, over time, at least the last five years uh, for telemedicine, um, they have increased the number of codes. So there are uh, there are increase in the number of codes uh, that I've seen. Um, I think that malpractice in the future, they will. Um, I think that they will uh, protect providers uh, uh, more. Uh, the reimbursement in terms of, uh, you know, malpractice reimbursement, reimbursement is apples to apples. Uh, you know, you're going to, in a lot of uh, those codes, you're going to get reimbursed the same amount if you see them through telemedicine or if you see them in the office. So what does that mean? You're actually going to be able to see more patients, uh, which would be, uh, which is, you know, key for providers, especially because there's, you know, a higher population of patient pool and then uh, there's going to be less providers. So you're going to be able to see more patients. You're getting paid the same amount. Uh, you're going to be able to provide a better quality of care, um, and uh, it's just going to be better overall. And I do think that you know, it, it, what I've seen is that in especially in the rural setting, uh, there's actually telemedicine. There's a decrease um, in malpractice versus the urban setting. So there's you know, in a sense, there's a lot of disparity. I think that um, things will change. I think there will be that reduction um, or protection for providers for malpractice and, and that reduced risk. Want to learn more about these topics? Make plans to attend SMA's Southern Regional Assembly June 27th through 29th in Birmingham, Alabama. Visit sma.org forward slash assembly for more information and to register.